The next talk is about um, uh, clinical validation of 4D flow MRI for cardiac valvular uh, disease by Jean-Francois Paul, also from Paris. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to present the clinical application <laughs> with 4D flow. In uh, our study, I will present mainly our studies about uh, comparison between 4D flow MRI in echo, uh, uh, compared to echo in valvular regurgitation, aortic and mitral. So quickly, the data acquisition are made with a G uh, 1.5T uh, machine with a 4D flow sequence, which is the whole thoracic acquisition free breathing, passage gated, without respiratory gating. The acquisition time is typically seven minutes and is contrast enhanced, but with the experience, we need less and less contrast. And the post-processing is made with Arteris cloud-based solution. So the first step is to detect the leak uh, and in this case, you can see uh, easily two leaks, one mitral and one aortic. And it's the clinical impression of severity is already important. Here with this image, you can uh, guess that the aortic leak is less important than the mitral leaks because of the size uh, of, the, of each one and also the high velocity uh, visualized with the red color, uh, the high velocity flow. So you have the impression that the mitral leak is more important, which was the truth, of course. Um, now, the important point is quantification. You have two ways to quantify the leak. First, direct measurement of the regurgitant volume by dynamic contouring of the leak or indirect measurements, calculating systolic flow minus pulmonary flow. And what is very important is that values should match. If the values doesn't match, there is somewhere an error in measurements. And uh, it was explained nicely by Arshid. There is many uh, possibilities of flow disturbance which may impair the, the real va value, but with this control, it's become, and with a little of experience, it comes easy to, to, to do it. So let's look to an example. Here is a aortic regurgitation, and you generally, I'm two or three centimeters below the valve to make the contour of the leak with a good level of confidence, and you obtain the curve and you can read directly the positive flow here and the number is 7.5 uh, liters per minute of regurgitation. So is it real true because you can have interference with mitral flow? So you are not sure of this first measurement. So in the second step, you calculate the systemic flow. Generally, you have to be below the aortic valve to be in the laminar flow. And here you can read the positive flow. It's 11.4 liters per minute. After you do the same with the pulmonary flow, and here you read four liters per minute. So the difference is 7.4, which is very close to the direct measurements. So you can be almost sure that you are, uh, you, the number is correct because you have the mass conservation law. So you can, of course, calculate the, the fraction of regurgitation easily. So now the, the, the gold standard is ECHO. So uh, we follow the European recommendation of ECHO to classify the severity of aortic regurgitation into mild, moderate, or severe. Probably you know already much better than me how to do it with up to 10 parameters, which is some, somewhere complicated, especially when the parameters doesn't match in the same direction. So we, 
we conduct a study with two experienced cardiologists, which have more than 25 years of experience each. They do the readings blindly, then perform a consensus statement. For 4D flow, we use two readers, and we use, uh, by using the technique which was explained just before, and we, uh, we use the mean value of the two read readings. So with, it was possible to calculate for both techniques intra and inter-observer variability. And after, we were able to compare 4D flow to TTE. And for uh, TTE, we have two uh, comparative uh, measurements. One with the quantitative parameters derived from uh, TTE, which were volume uh, the volume and the uh, fraction of regurgitation. And after the qualitative classification, mild moderate of sever, versus 4D flow. But for 4D flow, we have to, to make this comparison, we were uh, obliged to uh, give optimal threshold because depending on the threshold you use, of course, the comparison may be very different. So let's see uh, two examples, one of ex eccentric sever um, regurgitation due to a prolapse of the valves, and here, uh, central regurgitation due to aortic, dilata aortic root dilatation. As it was uh, also shown by Arshid, you see here the holodiastolic reversal flow in descending aorta, which is an indirect sign reflecting the severity of aortic regurgitation. So uh, the numbers informed us that the variability with TTE was three times larger than the variability with 4D flow, which is a very important um, information at least for the regurgitant fraction. We also find, found a systematic bias between TTE, which overestimated uh, flow compared to 4D flow with MRI in a range of 6.4%. Of note, this kind of, this tendency of overestimation was also, also found in studies comparing TTE and uh, 2D MR. Now, uh, with a qualitative assessment with TTE, with a multi-parametric approach, with a standard of, uh, of use, uh, the, the inter-observer variability was very good, uh, the intra-observer variability was very good, inter-observer variability was good which means in two very experienced observers, you have still some level of variability by uh, TTE. So after, um, after trying different thresholds, we uh, select 20 and 40% of uh, regurgitant fraction with 4D MRI to have the best agreement with TTE. In this condition, we reach 87% um, 80, of, uh, uh, of agreement, so 29 cases on 33, which leads to a weighted kappa of 0 0.82, which is a good agreement. So in summary, using the GE MR sequence and the arteries cloud-based software, we were able with uh, not a very long experience to provide an aortic uh, regurgitation classification very close to consensus of experienced echocardiographist. And we were able to provide quantitative value with a good, a good reproducibility. So now let's move uh, to mitral regurgitation. So the protocols were about the same. We have two readers. There were two different readers, but with a lot of experience by TTE. And also a, um, a dual lecture with MRI. 
So the inter-observer agreement with 4D flow MRI was very good with an intra-class correlation of 0 0.94. And also the TTE inter-observer agreement was good with a kappa of 0 0.75. Now uh, we, we choose uh, optimal threshold in terms of volumes at uh, 20 and uh, 40 milliliters to get a very good agreement between 4D flow and TE for mitral regurgitation. And considering regurgitant fraction, we found the optimal thresholds were 20% and 37%, uh, which was very close, in fact, to the value found for Arctic regurgitation. So we have uh, also a check about uh, 2D uh, Cine MRI, and we, we compare the, the 4D flow mitral uh, inflow to the 2D uh, um, Cine MRI using SSFP uh, sequence. So we use the automatic cardiac output provided by artificial intelligence uh, with the platform of arteries. And we have, uh, we can confirm that the, the inflow in the, mi the mitral uh, inflow was very comparable. So what can we conclude that uh, 4D flow MRI is consistent and a reliable tool with a low inter-observer variability, and it provides a direct quantification for mitral regurgitation. So in our institution, now it's used as a gatekeeper before therapeutic decision, especially surgical intervention. And I think it's a, an important point to discuss because there is a lot of papers now which are coming to show, to, to show that a lot of patients are operated without so severe mitral uh, regurgitation. So the general conclusion is after threshold optimization, valvular regurgitation can be reliably evaluated with 4D flow MRI. We have a very good agreement for severity classification from TTE expert. It has a low inter-observer variability when uh, evaluating valvular leaks. So for us, at least in our institution, it should be soon the new gold standard before a surgical decision. Thank you.